Good morning, everybody. And hopefully you can hear me today. Can you hear me? Yes, good, that's good. All right, we got that. No technical difficulties going on today. Well, we're waiting for a few more people to arrive. We're just gonna review the sixth petition. I'm gonna put this back up on the screen so you can see it. On your own, just think, refresh your memory about what we talked about when we tackled the sixth petition last week. And then in the chat window, you can finish the prompt that's there. Jesus' wording of the sixth petition reminds us that as we face temptations, we focus on dot, dot, dot. <laughs> There's your cue. I can't believe how fast this has gone. Here we are in the seventh petition already this week. Unbelievable. Yeah, people are rolling in. For those of you just joining us now, welcome. And we are in the review portion, thinking back to our discussion of the sixth petition. Lead us not into temptation. And I see some answers rolling into the chat window, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't still participate. Think it through. The Lord's Prayer, like all of Scripture, is inexhaustible, simple on the surface, and deep when you dig into it. And that's part of the beauty of this prayer is, man, oh man, oh man, you can just study and ponder this and find new things, new insights into it every time you go through. So don't let other people's answers slow you down. Yeah, good, I see. See a few answers rolling in there. Reviewing the sixth petition, God doesn't tempt. That was the basic thing that we, we wanted to make sure we are clear about. And yet there's some, some geniusness in the way that Jesus worded this petition as it may appear to be uh, confusing on the surface. In fact, somebody asked last week about the Pope changing the wording to this petition. So I did do a little research on that. He was proposing that they change the wording into let us not fall into temptation, which is a fine way of interpreting the words of the Lord's Prayer. But even the Wikipedia article noted, that's not what the, the Bible actually says. Whoops. <laughs> so in, there's something genius about the fact that Jesus would word the petition this way, lead us not into temptation. Because it's clear that God doesn't tempt anyone to sin, but as I see the answers rolling in here, what we noticed is by wording it in that way, it directs our attention to God's action, not to our own, right? It, it directs our attention to, to say, if we are going to overcome temptation, it's not going to be because we're superheroes on our own. It's that God, God would need to take action. After all, that's why you pray, right? You're, when you're praying, you would be seeking God's intervention, seeking God's assistance, God's help, so on and so forth. So good. Glad to see those answers rolling in. In fact, yeah, we said, what do we focus on? We focus on the gospel, right? We focus on the forgiveness that God has given to us and the creation of that new self that is created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. That it, That is that heart of faith that wants to do what God says is good and right and pleasing in his word. If we focus on our failures, if we focus on some sort of method or something to be attempting to, to uh, harness or discipline the old sinful nature, we we'll probably will find ourselves having some measure of outward success, but we probably will also find that, that it doesn't last all that long or that uh, circumstances conspire against us and our best efforts come to nothing. So instead, we focus on what God has done. Good to see all those answers rolling in there. And no, we're not going to change Jesus' words to say, let me not fall because of temptation. But it's good for you to have those words in mind as you pray the Lord's Prayer so you can think through what exactly that petition means. So, good. Glad to see those answers. And it looks like we're ready to roll into number seven. Seventh and final petition of the Lord's Prayer. Once again, this is Codex Vaticanus written by some scribe with OCD in beautiful handwriting far better handwriting than I have. That's one of the great and tragic losses in our digital age is the loss of nice handwriting. The, the seventh petition begins with the word, but. 
but it's Allah in Greek. Allah risai he mas apa tu poneru is what it says. And that, that word but, that conjunction remains in our prayer. And I, I guess to go through this word by word, you don't want to make too much out of that conjunction as if this is merely the second half of the sixth petition. That is when we say lead us not into temptation, that's kind of like the negative and this is kind of like the positive. I would rather see that petition a little more broadly to see that in many ways, the seventh petition summarizes everything that has come above. And I think as we dig into this today, that's what I'd like to drive home is that we probably have a too narrow of a view of what constitutes evil. And we need to broaden that idea of evil out to see evil from God's perspective, not necessarily from our perspective. And in that way, you might see that conjunction beginning the seventh petition as kind of the indicator of summation or summary, wrapping everything up in a very comprehensive way. So then we get the word deliver, which is a good and fine translation. It can be, it can be translated rescue or save as well. Like when the, when the crowds were mocking Jesus on the cross and they said, he saved others, let him save himself. This is the word that they used. And it's, I mean, it's straightforward. It's easy enough for us to understand that one. We get to the word us, but deliver us. And I know we haven't spent a lot of time talking about those little pronouns. Again, you remember that the Lord's Prayer is divided between the first three petitions that have to do with your, with God, and then the last four that have to do with us. But the whole thing begins with the word our. And way back at the beginning, we talked about how important and valuable it was to see that this is the our Father that we pray. That is that we are not alone whenever we pray this petition, whenever we pray this prayer, we're not alone. We're praying with everyone who belongs to the household of God. And in fact, we are praying in the name of Jesus, who is our brother. You know, he stands with us as our brother as we pray to our father. And I want to spend just a little bit of time thinking about this word here, but deliver us from evil. I guess the way I think about it is, that we tend to think about this petition very self-centeredly, very selfishly. I mean, I can easily recite all of the evil things I don't want to happen to myself, but how often do we remember to pray this petition for, for more than just me, myself, and I, for others in our lives? And Since it's Mother's Day today, I'm going to give a shout out to all moms everywhere because moms know how to pray, deliver us from evil. They've mastered it as they have watched their children grow up. You know, they, they learned to pray, but deliver us from evil when little baby, little infant in all of its helplessness is laying in the crib at night and you pray, deliver this child from evil, right? That's what moms do. And, and kid grows up and then they watch the child sail off on two wheels on a bicycle. Same prayer. Uh, fast forward a few more years and kid takes the car out for the first time and you better believe that moms everywhere are hitting their knees and praying, deliver us from evil. And I suppose that never ends. So uh, spend a moment to thank your mother today for the prayers she offered on your behalf. She knows how to pray the us and deliver us from the evil or, or the evil one. So keep that in mind as you think about this petition, that this is much broader than just this kind of self-centered, selfish prayer. And it's really good for us to consider that in our prayers as well, lest we turn this whole Lord's Prayer into an exercise in, in self, self-identification and self-centeredness. We pray this on behalf of others very, very easily and directly and clearly when we're praying that others also besides ourselves would be delivered from evil. And then we get to the last words and the challenging one. You see the note on the side here, deliver us from, and then it is ambiguous in Greek whether this should be translated as that which is evil or as the evil one. In other words, Satan. It can be translated either way. And in fact, in the history of the church, you'll find it translated both ways. I was, I was looking through this and noting that most of the early church fathers believed that this was to be taken as the evil one, as Satan. And uh, I'm talking about like Origen and Tertullian, and uh, I wrote them down, uh, Chrysostom, Orig Origen, Tertullian, Chrysostom, and Cyprian, and Luther. Luther also said, yeah, it seems to be talking about the evil one, which is interesting to me because Luther breaks with Augustine. St. Augustine, on the other hand, he stands for this as to be taken as a neuter, that is that which is evil. So the issue here is that the, 
that words in Greek, like most inflected languages, have a gender ascribed to them, either masculine, feminine, or neuter. And the way that this is formed, it could be either the masculine, which would be the evil one, or the neuter, which would be like that categorical evil, that which is evil. And I guess we, we're probably inclined because we've learned to pray it, deliver us from evil. We're inclined to think about it in that way, in the neuter sense, from that which is evil, deliver us from that which is evil. Just be aware that it could mean deliver us from the evil one. And really, those two are not as far apart as they might seem. In fact, here's what Luther says in the large catechism. He says, first of all, what he says before he gets to this quote, he says, it seems that this petition is speaking about the devil as the summary of all evil in this world. And then he says, because the devil is not only a liar, but a murderer as well. That's in John chapter eight. He incessantly seeks our life and vents his anger by causing accidents and injury to our bodies. He crushes some and drives others to insanity. Some he drowns in water. Many he hounds to suicide or other dreadful catastrophes. Therefore, there is nothing for us to do on earth but to pray without ceasing against this arch enemy. For if God did not support us, we would not be safe from him for a single hour. So whether you understand that last word in this petition to be evil in the sense of a gen like the general category of things which are evil or in the sense of Satan himself doesn't, in the end, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if, if it is Satan himself, well, then we're, he, we're talking about the, the evil that he would want to cause or uh, harm, you know, bring harm to our bodies, so on and so forth. So questions on the words of the seventh petition. I'm guessing you probably, maybe you've heard that before, that this could be translated, deliver us from the evil one. And I'm not suggesting an emendation to the way that we pray this. I don't think that that's necessary or wise, but um, it's good to be aware of that. Good. We've got all the words down. They're straightforward. That's all good. Let's see. I think I covered everything I wanted to say about this. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the doxology. Mike, wait for that for next time. <laughs> all right. And question mark indeed. We'll, we'll talk about that. So we are going to spend next week focused on the doxology and the amen. So hold on. Good question, though. Okay. Here we go. Then if we're going to unpack this petition, I think it's easy to simply divide it into two parts. What's the evil we're asking to be delivered from? And how does God go about delivering us? What's the deliverance? What's the answer to this prayer? And as I said, to begin with, I think when we approach this petition, we approach it with a rather narrow view of evil. And we probably think mostly about everything that would fall under the category of the fourth petition, like calamity, bad stuff, you know, bad stuff happening to us. And I think it's valuable if we see this at the tacked on to the end of the, the Lord's Prayer as a summation of everything that's come before. I think it's helpful for us to think through the evil that we're asking to be delivered from in each of the preceding petitions. So let's do that. We can broaden our view of evil simply by using the words of the Lord's Prayer. So go back to the sixth petition and type into the chat window your answer. What, is the, what would be the evil? that we want to be delivered from when we pray, lead us not into temptation. By the way, I think this one's pretty straightforward. Temptation, relying on self. Good, yeah, we can expand a little bit out from temptation, yeah, from sin, yeah. Good. Yeah. Sin. Yeah. Um, I see the relying on self threatens th things that threaten to uh, threaten our soul. Times we think we're helping, but might be sin. Things that remove us from the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Those are all good answers. So, you know, we pray, lead us not into temptation. And what is the evil? Well, it would be that we would fall into temptation. That is that we would sin. Yeah, and there we have, uh, we would be able to, we're praying that we would be able to resist that evil. Failing to do the good God has prepared as well. So sins both of, of commission, those things that we might do, but then also sins of omission, those things that we might fail to do. Good. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just use one word, but there's certainly a lot more 
but I wanted to summarize the evil in each of the petitions with just one word. And I've, I have listed the words I want to get out here, so we'll see how we do. Let's go back one more to the fifth petition, which said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What would be the evil that we are asking God to deliver us from when we pray those words? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Evil in the fifth petition. Yeah, unforgiveness, not completely forgiving someone, lack of love. Yeah. You see, the Ritters, they're going for the one word here. I said I got one word, and that's good. <laughs> Trying to, how can we forge this word together? Not completely forgiving someone, lack of love, hate, resentment, revenge, impenitence. Yeah, there certainly is that Im impenitence. We may have to, I may have to amend this and add two words here. So, man, that is certainly one of them, impenitence. That is that I would miss out on God's forgiveness. That would be a great evil. How about the second part? I mean, I got some good words. We got some good words going there. The one in the evil that I was thinking of in terms of as we forgive those who sin against us, the evil I was thinking of, I, can, I was just summarizing it with hard-heartedness, which I think brings together resentment, revenge, unforgiveness, lack of love, not completely forgiving someone like that. This would be an evil thing. And think about it. This is the, this is the brilliant part about looking back at the, the Lord's Prayer and identifying the evil in each of these petitions is that how often do we stop and think of something like that as evil? You know, we tend to think of evil as like a tornado smashing into our house. But how often do we think that hard-heartedness or holding on to a grudge or a retaining anger against someone else, that's evil. That's something that we need to be delivered from. How often do we think that uh, impenitence, that I can just kind of play fast and loose with sin and not worry about it? I mean, sin, too, in the sixth petition. How often do I think of that as evil? That This is one of the greatest evils of all, and yet I have such a narrow view of evil, I forget about it, that the evil things that might happen to the soul, I need to pray and pray that God would deliver me from them. I mean, what a terrible calamity it would be if in my hard-heartedness, with a lack of love, with resentment in my heart, I hold on to a grudge, and so I forfeit the forgiveness that God has promised to me, I mean, that would be the worst evil of all, wouldn't it? I mean, that's a, that's a terrible thing, something I definitely need to cry out and pray, deliver me from such great and shameful sins like that, Lord. All right, how about the fourth petition? This is where I think we t our minds tend to go when we pray, deliver us from evil. Calamity, calamity. I want to broaden that out. Let's expand that. That was actually was the word I was thinking of, but calamity. Let's list these calamities once again, just to refresh our memory. Deliver us from evil. Calamity, I think, is a good word to sum it up. Yeah, what hurts my body. Yeah, not recognizing God's hand in everything. Selfishness. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, being ungrateful. Think about that. There's another evil, that God would give me so much and that I would then say, and then that I would then say, oh, Lord, uh, I, I, you know, I forget to give thanks to him. That would, be, that would be a true calamity. Yeah. All right. How about the third petition? This is, I think, my favorite one when it comes to evil. What evil, when we pray, your will be done? What's the evil we're asking to be delivered from? Lack of trust, our own will, our own desires, Satan's will, selfishness, doubt, self-centeredness. <laughs> yeah, good. Are you ready for it? This is the word that I like for the third petition. Save us from ourselves, Lord. <laughs> Save me from myself. I mean, imagine this. If, if in the third petition we're praying your will be done, are we not praying that my will, I might, I might be mistaken? We tend to, th sometimes we pray with the idea that we're giving advice to God when we pray. You know, I'm going to tell God what I want to happen. And that's foolishness, you know? I think I've got it all figured out. So I tell God, here's my will. 
and I would like you to accomplish my will. But what if my will is wrong? What if actually what I'm praying for would kill me? <laughs> that would be a terrible thing. So what, what evil are we asking God to deliver us from when we pray deliver us from evil? We're asking him to deliver us from ourselves. You know, that can go multiple ways. You think about this. If my will or my desire, if my will and my desires, according to my sinful nature, are opposed to God's will, then when I pray, your will be done, I'm praying, let me not fall into sin. I mean, if my will were carried out and I fell into sin, that would be an evil thing. Another circumstance or another way of thinking about this is if I really, really, really want something and I, I just am convinced and certain that it's going to be good for me and uh, it, it actually isn't, then aren't we praying, God, don't give this thing to me. You know, we think there's so many things we think we want and that we think would be good for us that really aren't. And perhaps God's great grace is so often seen in not giving us the things that we so desperately want. And I know country music fans everywhere are thinking of Garth Brooks' song, Some of God's Greatest Gifts are unanswered prayers, <laughs> although that's not technically correct. It's not an unanswered prayer, but you get the point. That's kind of what he's saying is, you know, there's things in my life that I want that I think would be so great and good, but God knows better. So Lord, deliver me from myself and from my own crooked will and my own crooked agenda. And, and you know, you just think about this. So I want, I want an easy life. And God says, no, you don't get an easy life. Why? Because if you have an easy life, you're going you're gonna to assume that you have everything you need and you're going to get your entire reward right here and right now. This is, by the way, illustrated in the most terrible and frightening way in the Holy Scriptures with the example of hardenings. You know, you think about Pharaoh and Moses and the way that Pharaoh hardens his heart. And the first couple times it happens, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. And eventually, God withdraws his hand from Pharaoh and it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, what is God doing? He is giving Pharaoh over to his own will, his own desire. And that is like the worst thing possible. I mean, that is, that is true calamity. That's true evil, true disaster, that God would give us up to our own wills and our own desires. So when we pray, deliver us from evil, think about that. I'm praying, Lord, save me from myself, from my own mistaken thoughts and desires. Good. How about the second? The second and the first, I think, are closely related, but we can identify them. Oh man, look at that. You guys are on a roll. I don't just, is my camera showing my note sheet here? Do you guys, are you guys seeing this? Are you reading my answers here? I'm wondering, this is, yeah, unbelief. Yeah, loving other things above God. Yeah, the second petition where we pray your kingdom come, remember we said God's kingdom is gonna come with or without us. What we're praying for here is that it would come to us. And so we pray, that the evil would not be befall us in which we would miss out on his kingdom coming to us. That, it, that would be a great and terrible and a horrible evil, that unbelief would grip us and, and we would miss out on the coming of God's kingdom. So again, a terrible evil. And then the first petition, how about that one? I think the... The answer that's sitting there, loving other things above God, probably starts to get to it. Yeah. The first petition, your name be hallowed. What's most important in my life? Idolatry. Yeah, there it is. They're all rolling in. Yeah, save me from the evil of idolatry. And no, we're not going to go and start bowing down to statues, but there are idols out there, aren't there? In fact, many of these, the American idols are being revealed right now in this crisis. Where do we really put our confidence and where do we really put our trust? Oh boy, the idols are out there. Yeah, my confidence and my trust is in the economy as if that's the source of all good. My confidence and my trust is in the government as if that's the source of all good. You know, my, my confidence and my trust, where is it placed? Yeah, is it, is it in the things of this world or is it in my God? No, it's, it's uh, yeah. So your name be hallowed. Yeah, not, let me not forget who God really is. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Okay, good list. Now we've really expanded our definition of evil. So the question I have, is there anything that we're missing on this list or anything that the seventh petition would add to the list? This is maybe a little bit harder question. You're going to look through the list and say, yeah, what is it that I'm looking for?
I have an, an indefinite answer from the hunters. They weren't bold enough to just put it out there without punctuation. So we get the question mark, Satan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there's, there it is with the period. It adds God's act of deliverance. Yeah. Um, yeah, Satan. Wow, there we go. Okay, now we're shouting. Satan. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that Satan has been lurking in all of these, hasn't he? We've talked about Satan over and over and over again. You know, when we prayed, your kingdom come, we said that's because we're born into the, the devil's kingdom. And when we talked about God's will, we said there are other wills out there that are, are opposed to God's will, not only the crooked will within us, but also Satan's will and his desire to do what is evil. When we talked about the fourth petition, we said that Satan is always there stirring the soup, wanting bad things to happen so that he can rip us away from God or vice versa, giving us such a comfortable and easy life that we walk away from God on our own. And you, know, you can see Satan's hand in the fifth petition where he, he is trying to keep us in anger and uh, hold on to grudges, so on and so forth, keep us from receiving the gift of God's good forgiveness. Obviously, we see Satan acting in temptation. The seventh petition, I mean, sure, it names Satan out loud, but I wonder if there's anything more that we can add besides Satan. See, the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. Yep, there's evil there too. I'll put Satan down. Anything else we think about? that we haven't necessarily covered in the first six petitions or any other evil just in general that you've thought of when you pray, deliver us from evil. Satan, hell. Yeah. I mean, hell would be the, mess, the consequence of, of really losing any of these that precede. Anybody remember the small catechism? Do you remember memorizing the the words of the small catechism, deliver us from evil. What does this mean? In conclusion, we pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would deliver us from every evil that threatens body and soul, property and reputation. And finally, do you remember what the rest of it says? And finally, when? Yeah, see, we, that, that's just gone, isn't it? We might, maybe you hold on a little bit to the memorization of the Ten Commandments and the Creed. Yeah, when our last hour comes, there it is. When our last hour comes, the seventh adds the, the idea of the evil of a bad death. Save us from a bad death. And we should talk about that a little bit more. So when our last hour comes, shall come, grant us a blessed end. Yeah, so we're praying. And somebody mentioned this up above that this is, it adds God's active deliverance. So you're right. I mean, the seventh petition is that God should take action to keep us from all of these things. And what is a bad death? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we can skip and actually talk about that right now. Let's do that. We'll come back to God's answer. What is a bad death? Here is Bernard of Clairvaux on dying well. And maybe you remember the words or maybe you re recognize the words as to where they come from, from Bernard of Clairvaux's great hymn of the 11th century on the passion of our Lord, O sacred head now wounded, stanzas six and seven in our hymnal listed here. My savior then be near me when death is at my door and let your presence cheer me, forsake me nevermore. When soul and body languish, oh, leave me not alone, but take away my anguish by virtue of your own. Lord, be my consolation, one shield, my shield when I must die. Remind me of your passion when my last hour draws nigh. My eyes will then behold you, upon your cross will dwell. My heart will then enfold you. Who dies in faith, dies well. So, tell me, yes, what is a bad death? Let's start with that. Dolly says, a painful death, one that hurts me more. Yeah, there's oftentimes death, I mean, the thought of a painful death is something that is frightening to us. How am I going to die? Is it going to be long, drawn-out, protracted suffering? Uh, yeah, that would, be, that would be a painful death, but I wonder if that really is at the heart and core of what a bad death would be. Death without hope, one without the comfort of heaven, a lost faith, dying without faith. Yeah, suicide is an act of despair, death of the unfaithful. Dying in unbelief, thinking I deserve heaven on my own count, despair. Yeah, all of these things would, be, would constitute a bad death, would they not? That this would be an evil thing. Yeah, not surrounded by Christians. Yeah, uh, that 
that I might be left on, uh, on, to die unprepared, you know, in the, if you read through the earlier, uh, the history of the church, early Christian writers, they really are big on the idea of being prepared for death, maybe more so than we are. We live in a society, I mean, talk about American idols, bodily health is one of our idols. And so we push death and dying out of sight and out of mind, you know, we, we relegate the very elderly and those on the death's door to places where they can't be seen and we don't watch them die. And we just don't think about dying probably as much as we, we should because it really is something that we should, as Christians, should think about and, and ponder so that we are prepared for the hour of our death. And we've noted that a, a bad death, someone who's not prepared for death is someone who might die in unbelief. And I suppose you're keying off the words of Bernard there, who dies in faith dies well. And I mean, to think about that, that I might die in impenitence, holding on to my sins. I mean, can you imagine the, the dreadfulness of on your deathbed, regurgitating old grudges and thinking evil thoughts and stuff like that. And here's the thing is, guess who's going to be there when you're dying? Who's going to be there? Who's going to try to keep you from dying well? Who sees his last opportunity, yeah, Satan, right? Who sees his last opportunity slipping through his fingers? I need to be there. You better bet that Satan is there at the death of Christians. And what does he do? He holds before the, dying's, the dying person's eyes. He holds before them what? Their sin. And he says, you really think that you believed the truth or is it all just a lie? He holds between their dying eyes the languishing of their body you know, the pain and the suffering. And you say, you really think you have a good and loving God? You really think, uh, many of you have seen somebody when they died? You know, it is not a pretty sight, is it? Death is, is brutal and ugly. And the, to see the soul leaving the body and the way that the body turns that shade of gray. And uh, you look at that and you say, is there really going to be a resurrection of the dead? I mean, that's Satan's voice, right? Do I really believe that this body is going to rise again from the dead? Yeah. And so he holds before our eyes what it appears to, to us to be that God is forsaking us, that God's leaving us, that our sins are not forgiven, so on and so forth, that my body isn't actually going to be delivered and he wants to keep us from dying well. So good. So now let's flip to the converse. What is a good death? Tell me, what is a good death? One last thing I was going to add is, I think dying bitterly. People die bitterly, you know? They're bitter at the world, bitter at others in their lives, bitter about the way things have gone. That's not a good death, is it? Yeah. Trusting God and his promises. Yeah, hymns mean an awful lot, don't they? Dolly um, brings that up, that hymns mean an awful lot. And those things that we've memorized, you know? Why do we do memory work? Aren't we preparing for the time when when uh, everything else fails us and we want, we want some things to be so deeply ingrained in our minds, the ruts are so deep that we just fall into them uh, on autopilot, right? That's the beauty of the liturgy, the re repetition of the liturgy week in and week out as we recite the same words of the creed, as we sing the same words of the canticles. I mean, think about this. How many thousands of times in your life have you sung the words of Simeon? Lord, now you let your servant depart in peace. And wouldn't it be a beautiful thing as on your deathbed, deathbed, those words are so ingrained in your mind that they come to, to mind. And there it is. Lord, now you let your servant depart in peace. You know, trusting in God's promises. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. That's such a grand statement of the Holy Scriptures. Knowing heaven is your home. Yeah, a good death is one in which you're prepared, clinging to the cross until your last breath. You see that in Bernard's hymn here. My eyes will behold you upon your cross will dwell. There we go. I'm looking at Christ, not at myself. I'm looking at Christ. The moment our heart stops, our soul is in heaven. Yeah, the joy that our, our bodily life ends, but we are not lost to God. Think about Jesus' grand statement to the Sadducees. They are not dead, but living. For God is not the God of the dead, but the, the God of the living. To him, all are alive. You know, I cannot be dead to my God. Not if he has, by virtue of my baptism, made me his own. So I think the seventh petition, it is good for us to consider this, that this is a great evil 
to die poorly. And so when we pray, deliver us from evil, we are praying for a blessed end. Uh, Chemnitz, I think it's Martin Chemnitz who said that we would not die unexpectedly, you know, but that we would have clarity of mind to face our death with purpose and say this. And I, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a bad death if you die unexpectedly, but, but you understand the point that there's something wonderful about in, on your deathbed, holding on to the promises that God has made. And, and yeah, I mean, if, if possible, being surrounded by those you, uh, who love you and who bring Christ to you, so on and so forth. Knowing the sins Satan is reminding me of were paid on Jesus' cross. I face a God who remembers them no more. Yeah, right? And that's, you know, that's one of the beautiful things. Even uh, just a good story about that is uh, St. Thomas, Aquin uh, Thomas Aquinas, if you know that name. Thomas Aquinas, and you might make a scowl, you might scowl a little bit if you hear those words because you think of Thomas of Aquinas as the Roman Catholic theologian who brought Aristotle into theology. And he had this great grand system for organizing theology that at times was helpful, but many times was not helpful. And yet, if you read what Thomas of Aquinas said on his deathbed, it was, and his confession is, is just beautiful. You know, I've labored for you, O Christ. And now, I mean, he basically forgets everything that he spent his life's work doing and simply clings to Christ and the cross. And I think that's a really good thing. I mean, this is what Luther said about many of the monks in the monasteries. They spent their entire lives doing works, trying to earn God's favor. But when it came to the hour of their death, all those works by God's grace were forgotten and they simply uh, clung to Christ and rejoiced in the salvation that they found at the cross. Can, yeah, okay, here's a question. Three question marks, that must be a, a big question. Can dying well make us think too much about what we do to prepare for death? Well, if I think, I think question well stated, if I'm thinking about what do I need to do to prepare for death, where's the emphasis? If I'm casting this emphasis on myself, and saying, I've got to get it all, yeah, emphasis on we do. Emphasis, if that's the emphasis, if, is saying, I have to have all of the I's dotted and the T's crossed so that I'm ready. Well, you're, you know, that's, think about the, in, in regards to this question, even though it's not talking necessarily about death, think about the parables that refer to Jesus' return and tell us to be watchful at all hours. You know, the parable of the 10 virgins. Is this something that I'm doing, you know, that I have to, prepare myself either for the moment of Jesus' return or for my death, well, it's by God's grace that anyone would be prepared. So I think the emphasis should be on that, that faith, who dies in faith dies well. And you remember, of course, that faith is the creation of, of God's spirit, and it's created by word and sacrament. So what do I do? Well, remaining by God's grace, remaining rooted in word and sacrament, and uh, continually returning to my baptism, receiving the supper, listening to the word. This is, yeah, in many ways that prepares me for my death, right? That it's not all about me, but it's all about what Christ has done. So thank you. Good question. Good point. So yeah. All right. I think we got that covered. So let's back up to the second big thing about the sixth petition. What answer? How does God deliver us from evil? So we're praying, deliver us from evil. How should God do this? How does God do this? Give me an answer, but then you can't just give me an answer. I want a Bible story that illustrates the answer you have. So I see how many we can come up with. I think I got about six written down here. How does God go about answering this prayer? Deliver us from evil. What's God's answer? If I refer, another question mark. People are very cautious today. What would be uh, fiery furnace? How would, uh, what's the deliverance there? Can we identify one aspect of the fiery furnace? And actually in Daniel in the lion's den, it's the same one. Hold on, everybody. Let's just slow down. Angels, yes, there it is. Yes, he sends his angels. He sends his holy angels, fiery furnace, lion's den, right? What does God do? He sends his holy angels. Good, and Psalm 91 is there too. Okay, okay, hold on, here we go. Sent Nathan to David, let's go back up to this one. Sent Nathan to David so that David would confess his sin. Good, good Bible story. What's the deliverance from evil? Can we put our, our finger on that one? God's answer to David's evil is? Yeah, other people, yeah. Gives us one another. 
uh, Nathan, David. Can we think of any other examples where God uses other people to deliver us from evil? You should be able to sh shout out a whole bunch here. Reaching out his hand to Peter as he sinks in the water. Yeah, gives us one. Of course, that's Jesus. So all the Jesus stories kind of don't count when we're saying he gives us one another. Rahab and the spies, an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, okay, boy, we got a lot of answers coming here. Moses, the judges, Elijah, the widow. Yeah, Elijah and the widow. There's a nice one, isn't it? That, that's interesting. Yeah, Jonah. To the people of Nineveh, Jonah is God's answer to deliver us from evil doesn't work so well for Jonah, so God has to intervene directly, and he attempts to deliver, presumably delivers Jonah from evil, first with a giant uh, fish, and secondly, with a withering vine. You know, talk about drama. That's great. And uh, Jonah, 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 Jonah. Okay. I'm going to back up here. Oh, boy, we got a lot of answers. So I got Stephen, death after his confession. Yeah, that is uh, what would be I mean, we've talked about this. Now, what's another way that sometimes God delivers us from evil? The, uh, maybe what you might call the ultimate solution from evil, as exemplified by Stephen. Yeah, takes us to heaven, calling us out of this world. There is another way that God delivers us from evil, right? I mean, that is, that is a way that God might answer that prayer. I pray, deliver me from evil. And his answer might be, I am going to take you out of this world now. Think of other examples of that one. I see the thief on the cross there. Other examples where you see God delivering someone from evil by their death. Okay, we got Isaiah 57. Samson, I wondered if someone would say Samson. You know, Samson's an interesting one. I mean, the evil in Samson's life is not just the Philistines, but himself. I mean, if anybody, if any, I mean, we all need to pray, deliver me from myself. But if anybody needed to pray, deliver me from myself, it was Samson. <laughs> John the Baptist, yeah. Juan Baptiste, yeah. He was called out of this world in, in the most unglorious way. And yet this is God's answer to deliver him from evil. So, yeah, I almost put a question mark. Can we say Samson's? Is, it is finally a delivery from evil, isn't it? I mean, this is why it's, re the way it's recorded in scripture says that this is God's answer to his prayer. Okay, I, can we, if, if you type something up above, can you give me another answer here? Just, I, the chat has moved on quite quickly, but other ways that God might deliver us from evil. Can we get a number four? And again, I'm not trying to neglect anything that was typed above, but I'm, rather than scrolling through all those answers, repeat it if it has not yet been stated. Miraculous intervention in this world and his word, miracles. Okay, I see miracles. You're thinking about some... Let's, let's take that one. Rather than, um, I, think, I think we don't have to, always, it doesn't always have to be miraculous, does it? Simply removing the affliction. And that can be done miraculously, but give me some examples where God, his answer is, I will take this evil away from you. Can you give me a Bible story where you, you see that? Okay, feeding the Israelites in the wilderness, we, can, we could uh, put that one down there. Jesus healings, the lepers, yeah. Can you, so we got some miraculous ones. Can you think of one that you might call less miraculous? Yeah, Joseph. I think Joseph is a good one of a less miraculous example. I mean, Joseph's deliverance comes from prison is not necessarily like miraculous. You know, Peter's, the, the chains fall off, the doors open, and Peter walks out of prison. Joseph doesn't just walk out of prison miraculously. It happens through a series of events by which God finally removes the, the affliction. You guys are all right in saying, yes, these miracles. I mean, sometimes this is God's answer. Sometimes the doctors scratch their heads and say, we don't know what happened. I mean, it's just, it happens. Well, yeah, God can Okay, fine. Yeah, thank you. Call me on the technicality. His ability to interpret dreams was miraculous. Granted. Can we think of an even less miraculous time when God removed afflictions from the people? <laughs> fine, I challenge you. Can you think of a less miraculous one? Hmm. Can we think of something like that? Widow and the oil and flour. Well, yeah, I mean, the jar of oil and flour didn't run out, so that falls into the 
yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gathering up some sticks to bake one last loaf of bread before I lie down and die. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Abraham rescuing Lot. Well, you see, the problem with Abraham rescuing Lot is I probably should put it up here until he gives us one another. But he does remove the affliction. The Israelites were let out of Babylon. There we go. Good. Yeah, like the return from exile. I was just looking at Jeremiah 29. You know, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And if you look at the beginning of Jeremiah 29, the first thing he says is, you guys might as well just put down roots because you're going to be in exile for quite a while. <laughs> but eventually this return comes and it's not necessarily miraculous in any way, shape, or form. And yet it's God's intervention in this world through the governing authorities that he brings about a removal of the affliction. So, good. Okay, how else does God deliver us from evil? Someone said, I mean, his word, that's true, that is good, and uh, I, I spread of the gospel would fall into that. Um, yes, by allowing his gospel to reach us, let's put it that way, delivers us from so many of those evils. Can we think of an example of this one, by allowing his gospel to reach us? Bible story? You know, the Ethiopian eunuch. Yeah, that's a good one. You even spelled eunuch correctly, which is pretty good. Yeah, Philippian jailer. Saul on the road, right? Good. Any others? Somebody brought up Nineveh again. Somebody brought up Job before. And let's, let's talk about Job. But think about the story of Job and how, what in particular is God's answer to deliver from evil. And I'm, I'm thinking not in terms of the fact that Job got everything restored, but even before that. What is sometimes the way that God answers this prayer? Okay. He limits... He allows the pain and the affliction, but what? He limits or who? All right. He limits, there it is, Satan, loud and clear. Yeah, Job so, shows us that God's answer to delivering us from evil is very often that he sets limits on what Satan can and cannot do. Go back to what Luther said. Luther said that the devil's not only a liar, but a murderer. And if he had his way, none of us would enjoy a single bite of bread in peace. And so what, what does God do? Well, more than we probably ever realize, he sets limits on Satan. And the account of Job shows us that. I mean, the limits that uh, Satan is allowed in the account of Job are very liberal. And yet, nevertheless, Satan is limited and he does not have complete and total control. And when we pray, deliver us from evil, boy, is that a beautiful thing that we have the confidence that, that Satan cannot simply do whatever he wants. Yeah, and this is, I like this thought in the chat window here too, that with Job, he takes things away and makes him realize that God is enough. Yeah, that's a good answer to evil is sometimes it's actually sending the affliction. And that, that um, brings me to the last one is how else does he answer this prayer? Giving us the strength, patience, and wisdom to endure. Can we think of examples of that? Where God gives strength, patience, and wisdom to endure rather than removing the affliction Okay, right, in our current circumstance right here. Yeah. Paul and his thorn. Yeah, I thought Paul and his thorn might come up. You think about that. Uh, yeah, David and Saul. Yeah, think about that, that David, instead of striking Saul down, lets him live, lets his adversary live. Yeah, the flood. I mean, if you guys think you're cooped up in isolation right now, let's, let's be real. Think about Noah in the ark. Think about how long he was there. With no one but his family and no Netflix, no Disney Plus, no YouTube, you know, nothing to, nothing to stream. So other than endless rain, <laughs> rain, 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 water, 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 water everywhere. So Abraham's promise of a son. Yeah, there's another example of strength, patience, and wisdom to endure. So good. I think, can we think of, I, I mean, this is, I think, a pretty comprehensive list. If we're talking about how does God deliver us from evil, here we have a lot of good thoughts down and we have these all recorded. I mean, think about this. This is amazing, the way that God works in this world of ours, if we only but opened up our eyes to see. I mean, think about the servant of Elisha, where Elisha prays, Lord, open up his eyes to see, and suddenly he sees the fiery horses of, of God all around him, surrounding him. 
and um, wow, here's God's answer. I am surrounded by evil on every side. There is evil within me. And by the way, let's not forget, it's us. So not only me, but those, uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ and those whom I love and care for are also surrounded by evil. And if I only but could open up my eyes, I would see how God is active every moment of every day answering this prayer, even before I ask it, and even more than I realize I need to ask it. There he is, setting limits on Satan. There he is, removing and diverting great calamities from happening and falling upon us. There he is, sending his holy angels to walk alongside us. There he is, giving us one another. And let me just focus on that one for a quick minute here. I said this once before in this class, that oftentimes, it seems to me, he gives us one another. Focus on this one here. Oftentimes, ah, I can't see it then. Oftentimes, when we pray, it seems to me that when we pray for someone else, it seems to me that God uses us to be the very answer to that prayer, you know? And so I'm going to go back to mothers because it's Mother's Day once again. Thank you, mom. And you pray this prayer, deliver us from evil. And what do mothers do? Well, they watch over their children. And so often it's a mom who's the answer to this prayer for their child, keeping the child from harm, you know, disciplining them so that they learn uh, safe and, and right ways to behave in this world, so on and so forth, all of these things. Well, it's a beautiful answer to that prayer. And I guess my encouragement to you is, if you've not thought about this before, think about the seventh petition as an intercessory pet petition. That is something that you can pray on behalf of others and see if, if you are not sometimes the answer that God has for someone else's evil. You know, someone else finds themselves burdened, afflicted, in trouble and difficulty. And what do they need? They need someone else to give them, to share God's word with them so that his gospel can reach them. And so that through his word, he might give them the strength, patience, and wisdom to endure. And that might just be you, right? That might just be you. I mean, go back to our current situation right now. I mean, uh, sure, we can't see each other right now, but we have so many ways we can reach out to one another and do this. You know, bear with each other, listen, and, and help. Yeah, help, help one another bear up with strength, patience, and wisdom so that, uh, you know, we don't, we're not, nobody feels like they are all alone. God gives us one another. It's a great answer to delivering us from evil. So good, a good comprehensive list of answers. Here's an interesting thing about the seventh petition is that it's actually prayed. This very petition is actually prayed by somebody in the Bible, believe it or not. Number seven, prayed by Paul. This is in Second Timothy, and this is Second uh, Timothy. Paul's presumably at the very end of his life. He's about to be martyred, as tradition tells us. And he says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. So, so much for that answer. That deliver us from evil means having others. Paul says, may it not be charged against them. But what was God's answer? But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. So listen to that. Sounds an awful lot like the answers we just listed on that slide, isn't it? Uh, doesn't it say that? God strengthens us. God st stands by us in the midst of all adversity. And then he says this, and these are, I mean, in essence, this is the seventh petition. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. And the word for rescue is the same one that's used in the seventh petition. It is interesting here that he says this very straightforwardly and clearly. It's every evil deed. He does not say from every evil, from the evil one. So, uh, that may be, I mean, in terms of going back to what is, what is it that we're talking about, evil in general or the evil one, I guess this would perhaps tip our hand to thinking that maybe we're, we've got it right in our translation from evil as a category or evil things in general. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Grant me a blessed death, right? There it is. Grant me a blessed death. And uh, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Aha! A doxology. We'll have to come back to that next week. Final questions to wrap up our discussion of the seventh petition. I'm going to take a minute here to look at all your smiling faces. Good to see so many of you today. Final questions going once. I'll take a drink.
All right, let's bow our heads and pray this prayer, thinking about that great deliverance that God gives us from all evil. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. All right. Let's see here. I do have this up. I, uh, next time, we're going to cover the doxology. Doxology. We'll once again go back to our list of circumstances for each petition, and then we'll cover the Amen. So next week, wrapping it up, and I look forward to that. We'll see you then. So God bless you all. See you later.